standing and we'll read the uh, text together in Isaiah chapter number 11. Isaiah chapter number 11, continuing our study in the book of Isaiah. We're going to read this evening just a, a brief uh, text this time for the message from verse 1 down through verse number 5. We're thinking on the, on the subject of the restoration of the kingdom. We've said before that when we get to chapter 11, we see that God is uh, is restoring his people, the people of Judah, the people of Israel. Uh, Isaiah uh, said much to us about the uh, Assyrian invasion that would come upon Judah and Jerusalem. Uh, we've seen how that God would judge the enemy, the Assyrians, how that God would deliver uh, his people, would intervene uh, in the situation as they got right up to the walls of, uh, uh, and the gates of Jerusalem. And we see here in chapter 11 now, he looks ahead. He looks to the restoration of the kingdom uh, that God has promised to come. It's Messiah's kingdom. It's the kingdom of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That he will rule and reign on the earth from uh, the temple in Jerusalem in the millennial uh, reign of Christ upon the earth following the rapture and following the tribulation period. And so let's pick it up in verse number one. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1 And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse And a branch shall grow out of his roots And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him The spirit of wisdom and understanding The spirit of counsel and might The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord And he shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes Neither reprove after the hearing of his ears but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for the reading of the word of God. And we pray that you would now speak to us and teach us through your word, by your Holy Spirit. Lord, teach us your word. Help us to study. Lord, help us to see what you have for our understanding uh, this evening. And Lord, we'll thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen 
Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, we know that God will deliver Israel from the Assyrians. Uh, we know that even we'll, we'll read it, we'll come to it, and, and you can go back and you can read uh, in the scriptures and in uh, 1 Kings and, and so forth. You can see where God did that. And so God will deliver Israel from the Assyrians. But many times through history, God has delivered his people, hasn't he? Just over and over uh, after he judged them and after he punished them for their sins. And all of those times, he would come back and he would deliver them. Remember, he's always promised a remnant that Israel will never be completely annihilated. It will never be fully destroyed. God promised that there will be a remnant. And for that remnant's sake of God's promise, there's going to be a restoration and there's going to be a kingdom. Uh, there will be the kingdom of heaven come to the earth and Jesus will be here as the, as the Jews Messiah. He'll be here as uh, the, the church's bridegroom. He'll be here as, as, as our savior and he'll be here to rule and reign uh, on the earth. And so there's going to be a restoration. And in all those times that God would judge his people and then punish them uh, for his sins, he would, he would then send deliverance. And in all those times of deliverance, there is a prophetic view that is looking ahead to a final time of deliverance when God will bring a restoration, uh, when his kingdom will rule on the earth. It is what we will refer to as the millennial kingdom of the Messiah. It will be a 1,000, a literal 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. And he will rule and reign in righteousness. It's a promised kingdom. It is the Messiah's kingdom. And my friend, you just mark it down. It's going to happen. It is on its way. And it may not be too far away. Uh, the thing about it is we know that it's going to be uh, at least seven years away because it will be after the tribulation period. The tribulation will start right after the rapture. We don't know when the rapture will take place, but we know when the second coming of Christ, when he comes to the earth and sets up his kingdom and is on the throne in the rebuilt, in the, in the, in the newly built temple there in Jerusalem, uh, we know that's going to happen seven years after the rapture. And so if God takes us out in the rapture to meet the Lord, to catch us up in the air, to be with him, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, as the Bible describes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, when we'll be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, and we'll be, when we will uh, enter into his presence and we'll have a glorified body like he is, and we'll, uh, there'll be others that will be resurrected from the grave and they will receive their uh, glorified bodies. We're going to be reunited together with loved ones and family members and friends that have gone on before, uh, before us. And when that great day of reunion takes place, uh, then... Seven years, the Bible says, tribulation is going to be on the earth. At the end of that, Jesus comes and he sets up his kingdom. And so when we say this millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, it may not be so far off. Uh, it may only be about seven years uh, because I believe we're close, very close. At any moment, the Lord can come and, and, uh, and take us to glory to be with him. And, but so this, that's what this is talking about, this 1,000-year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ on the earth that the Bible tells us about in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter number 20. If you'd like to find it and follow along, I'm going to read beginning with verse number 1. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Uh, John writes this, and, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. How many years? A thousand years. You see that? And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years shall be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loose uh, a little season. Verse number four, and I saw thrones and they that 
uh, they uh, sat upon them and judgment was given unto them and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast neither his image neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ notice the next thing a thousand years you see that verse 5 but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. And so you see three times in those brief verses there, well, he mentions it again in verse number seven, but three times there in those verses, it talks about the thousand years. I believe there's a reason why the Spirit of God repeats this for us uh, so many times over and over in the book of the Revelation. It's because we need to recognize that it is to be taken literally. There will be a literal millennium. That's the word for 1,000. A millennium, 1,000 years. It needs to be understood literally. It's mentioned really actually uh, six times altogether from in Revelation chapter 20 from verse 2 down through verse number 7. And so the Bible makes it very emphatically clear that, uh, that Satan will be restrained. He'll be bound in a chain. He'll be cast in that bottomless pit for a literal 1,000 years. And he's not bound now, is he? Oh, he, he's, he's alive and, and he's well and he's free to roam, roam the earth and to roam the, uh, roam the, the airways, which, uh, uh, which is his, his battleground. Listen, he's not bound now. He's still walking around. As Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, uh, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may uh, devour. And so he's not bound now. But the Bible says, and we must believe it, it's going to happen, and it could be much sooner than we realize that Satan will be bound, and he'll be bound for 1,000 years. And here's the beautiful thing about it. There will be once and for all and finally, peace and righteousness will actually rule the earth for that 1,000 years. That's what's going to take place. Now, if you continued to study in Revelation chapter 20, which we've already studied together here as a church, uh, we know that at the end of the 1,000 years, uh, Satan's going to be released, and, uh, and then there's going to be another war, but it's going to be the final war. We're not going to be in it, uh, but Jesus is going to defeat Satan and all of his uh, demons, all of his fallen angels, and all of those of the world, the nations, of the people that would follow after, uh, af after him, after the devil, they will be defeated finally, and then they will actually become a new heaven and a new earth. We will move into an eternity that the best thing for us to think is it is going to be so good, it's, it's just unimaginable. But that's what's headed. That's what is coming our way. Prior to this is going to be this 1,000 year reign of Christ upon the earth. Now, understand this. We believe in what we should refer to and what we do refer to as the premillennial return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. We believe in the pre-tribulational rapture of the church as the bride of Christ. Now, there are other views. There are some odd views. There's some strange views. There, there's, there's some other views. There are three major views about the second coming of Christ. And, and one, of course, is, as we said, we, we believe the premillennial. I believe that that is the proper way to literally interpret the scripture. And it's the best view that fits with an understanding of, of, of the dispensations of time, which I believe it's, I believe that's correct to understand uh, the scriptures from a dispensational uh, viewpoint as well. Uh, the premillennial view is what fits uh, with this uh, so much better. There is what's called amillennialism, which means that they, they don't believe that there's a millennium, uh, millennium at all. They just believe that... Uh, that everything on the earth is going to just uh, gradually get better and better and better. Then it's just going to get so good that, that God's going to come down. Jesus is going to be with us and we'll just all uh, go off in the sunset all uh, nice, and, nice and happy. No tribulation, no millennium. None. They, well, they, they believe actually or teach that we're already in tribulation. 
Now that's already been going on. Already take, it's already taken place. And now we're in that thing of getting better and better. I don't see it getting better, do you? I don't see the world uh, headed towards righteousness and holiness. Uh, I see it getting more wicked. And the Bible says that it will be more wicked. It's gonna, uh, wickedness is going to wax worse and worse, the Bible says. It's not going to get any better. It's going to get worse. The only thing that's going to make it better is when Jesus comes. Amen. And, and so uh, that's the amillennial view. There is a post-millennium view which believes that uh, uh, Jesus does not come until, uh, until the, the end of the 1,000 years or when we're in that 1,000 years, whatever. It's, it's really hard to follow their belief on that. But it doesn't fit with the scriptures. And so that's why I say we believe in the premillennial return of Christ and the pre-tribulational rapture of the church. That according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, before the Antichrist is revealed, the, the rapture has got to take place. Uh, we're going to be caught up. We're going to be taken out of the way. And it's not until after that that the Antichrist on the earth, that man of sin that Daniel uh, speaks of and we read about in Daniel chapter 9 that describes that seven year period of tribulation on the earth uh, it's, it's not until after the rapture that all of that appears uh, on the earth many people are trying to think well who guessing who's going to be the antichrist who is the antichrist is he is he alive today well i believe the devil's got his man ready in every generation because the devil don't know when when jesus is coming he don't know when the rapture is going to take place he knows that as soon as the rapture takes place, then he then he's going to be he's going to cut loose on the earth. Uh, he knows that, and so I believe that every generation throughout all ever since the day, ever since the cross, ever since Calvary, the devil's always had somebody ready to fill that role because he don't know when it's going to happen. So sure, there's an, there's the Antichrist in the world today. Is he going to be the one? We don't know that because we don't know when it's going to take place. Uh, it, it will take place right after the rapture. And so there's going to be the coming of the Antichrist. There's going to be the tribulation period on the earth. But I, I believe the Bible teaches that we're taken out before that takes place. And then after the seven years, uh, then Christ will come and will restore his kingdom. Isaiah is saying here, in Isaiah chapter 11, that, that, that the Messiah will come, that there will be a restoration, that Messiah's kingdom will be on the earth. Can you say amen to that? That's what we believe is happening. Uh, that's what we believe is, is coming. And, and, and it can be sooner than, than later. Uh, the only thing that is to happen before it does is for the Lord to have the trumpet sound and step out on the cloud and call us up to be with him. But Isaiah is talking about here beyond the rapture, beyond the tribulation period to the coming of Christ and setting up his kingdom of 1,000 years on the earth. And so let's look at it. Uh, you can divide it up in a couple of ways. First of all, in verse number one, I would call this the prophecy of the branch, the prophecy of the branch, and, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. That, that word branch uh, is seen in other places in the scripture as well, and it is used in the Bible as a title for the Messiah. And so it's referring to the Messiah. It's referring to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the wrath of God it came against his, uh, his people and God allowed the Assyrians to devastate the land. We've already uh, understand that. But God promised that there would be a remnant. Let's not forget that. He promised that there would always be a remnant. And, and, and so uh, when you look at it in, the, in that fashion, this is describing this. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, a branch shall grow out of its roots. Now, now we can uh, have some of an illustration here. You, you know that uh, uh, it, it was as if, he's kind of describing it as if there's a tree that had been cut down even with the ground. And so all there is is that, is that, that stump, you know, there uh, on the ground. But have you noticed it? I've seen it happen. Have you ever cut down, you know, a tree? I mean, you cut it off, a tree or bush or whatever, cut it off right down to the, to the ground. Before long, do you not notice that, that uh, something starts growing back up again? 
And that, that tree, I mean, even an even oak, oak tree, it'll, you'll, you'll get new shoots coming up. Uh, it, you'll, you'll, uh, the tree will come back. The tree will grow again from its roots if it gets enough water. Amen. If there's enough water down in there and you don't see it. It's down underneath it. But it gets enough. It looks dry on top. It looks dead on top. As far as we know, it's dead. But lo and behold, before long, you start seeing the you start seeing the uh, the, the rods coming up, and then if you let it keep growing, you'll see the branches uh, come up. Job chapter fourteen, Job chapter fourteen, interesting uh, brief passage of scripture, where Job says in verse number seven, verse eight, verse nine. Listen to this: For there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again. And that the tender branch thereof shall not cease. Though the root thereof wax old in the earth, and the stock thereof die in the ground, yet through the scent of water it will bud and bring forth uh, boughs like a plant. It, it, it'll grow uh, again. And so Isaiah is applying this kind of thought, this kind of illustration, uh, I believe, to the nation of Israel, and in particular, to the stem of Jesse, as he calls it, or the tribe of Benjamin. And, and really, it's being applied here to the family of David. And so you have the word rod, uh, which, be, which is translated from a word that means actually means a twig. And it appears that growth uh, that came forth from, uh, though it was weak, and like, we, like the illustration, you cut off a tree down the ground, you got a stump there, and, 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 and what's the first thing that comes out? I mean, it's just little bitty things. It don't have no leaf on it, but it'll be just tiny. It'll be very, very weak. It'll be like a, like a twig uh, uh, that grows out. And so he's saying that there's this rod that's going to grow. It's weak, but it's alive. And then, and then it says uh, that there'll be a branch the rod, they'll come forth the rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The branch is the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the one that is spoken of as the son of David. Can you say amen to that? He is the son of David because David was in his earthly ancestry. We see that when we began our study in Sunday school in the book of Matthew, we saw that in the genealogy. When we study that in the first chapter there in Matthew's gospel. And so you put all that together and you understand he's talking about the coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. He's talking about Jesus who is the branch, who is who comes forth as a rod out of the stem of Jesse, out of David's ancestry. Jesse was, was David's uh, father. And, and so you understand this. The genealogy is really being spoken of here. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse number 5, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will, now listen to this, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. You know, the amazing thing is, this generation, this time that you and I are living in right now, we're, we're, we're more or less seeing, uh, been able to see this kind of play all, play out before our eyes. Because from the time of, of uh, uh, well, from the time of 70 A.D., uh, there, was, there, was no, uh, there was no Jewish state of Israel. There was no land of Israel. There was no Star of David flying anywhere in that land on, on their flag. There was none of that. And that never came about until the year 1948 in, in the month of May. So basically what we would call modern uh, uh, history. But now, now they're there. Now the land is there. Now, let me just use the illustration again of the flag, the Star of David. Uh, it flies again. Uh, it is visible again. It is there for many, many years, even, even hundreds of years. It was not even seen in the earth. It's like a tree, you see, that just been cut off. It's been cut off down to the ground. And, and, and so as far as people of the world was, uh, would have been concerned and would have, would have thought, I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing left of it anymore. But then it just, there was just enough water that, it, that, that that little twig started coming up. And the little twig got enough water that it started growing. And then, then there's a branch. 
All of this illustrating that there is coming the one from the lineage of David, the one that God has promised. It looked like it looked like that there was no. And if, if I understand it right, that with the Jews today, and I could be wrong. Somebody knows more about it. Could uh, could maybe uh, play it out for us. But as far as I know, there is no records of the genealogy of the people of the Jews. They they don't know who is from what tribe. In other words, nobody knows today of any Jewish-born person or individual that they can trace their, uh, their genealogy back, back to David or back to Jesse or, you know, back to that family. They can't trace their generation back to, uh, back to anyone because in the year 70 AD, when Rome destroyed Jerusalem, all of the records were gone. They've never been found again. There are no records. The Jews have been scattered throughout all of the earth. Uh, there is no understanding of what tribe they're from and so forth. So as far as the world is concerned right now, there's, there, there's not anyone that could fit the criteria uh, for us to know, hey, this one is of David. This one is of Jesse. This one's of the tribe of Benjamin. This may be the one that's the Messiah uh, that is to come. No, there's no record of that at all. But there is one that we know, that there is a record. The only one, and we said this when we were studying, uh, studied it in the book of Matthew in our Sunday school time, there is only one record uh, of, a, of a genealogy uh, from Israel and, and more specifically from, from David himself. There's only one record and that's the genealogy that we have in the Bible and it all leads up to one man and that is the Son of God that was born of the Virgin there in Bethlehem. There's none other that can fit this. There's no one else that this could be applied to. Do you see that? Jesus Christ is the branch. And he is the righteous branch that God promised David that he's going to raise him up and that he will be the king that will reign and that will prosper and that will execute judgment and justice in the earth. He will be the final king that will usher in that time of righteousness on the earth. He is the branch, the prophecy of the branch. And then I believe Isaiah describes for us from verse 2 down through verse number 5 concerning this restoration of the kingdom, this millennium reign of Christ, he describes the presence of the branch upon the earth. You have the prophecy in verse 1, the presence in verse 2 through verse number 5. And so verse 2, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Uh, and he and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. Shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Verse number two. I think is, is giving us an indication and understanding of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. It says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom, understanding, Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. It, it actually somewhat relates to a sevenfold description of the Holy Spirit. Uh, such as we find in Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1 and uh, verse number 4, uh, where it says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him, now listen to this, from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. The number seven actually means completeness or to be complete. And, and I think you, you know that. And, and what does the Bible say about Jesus? Colossians chapter one, verse 19, for it pleased the father that in him should all fullness dwell. Colossians chapter two, verse nine, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Look over to Luke chapter number four. Luke chapter number four. 
And as you do that, uh, let me, as you find it, let me read for you once again Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And look at what Jesus, let's remind ourselves of what Jesus himself uh, would say there in uh, uh, Luke chapter 4. And uh, I'll go ahead and pick up the reading with uh, verse 17. There is delivered unto, he's in a synagogue in Nazareth, early on in his ministry. And it says in verse 17, there is delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And so that's, that's Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He closed the book, gave it again to the minister, and sat down. The eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began to say to them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now he's quoting uh, in verse 18 of Luke chapter 4 from Isaiah chapter 42. And also there'd be a reference within this over to Daniel chapter number 9 as well. And so it ties it all in together with Isaiah chapter 11 and verse number 2 when it's talking about the presence of the branch, the one that was prophesied, the one that God promised the one that would be coming. And so I submit to us once again, there is only one person that can, uh, that can feel uh, the meaning of, of these verses here, and that is our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It can't be anybody else. Verse number three in Isaiah 11, and, and shall make him of quick understanding uh, in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. Now, isn't that an interesting thing where it says that, and it's talking about when he's on the earth in the millennium that is still that, that is coming, and, uh, this righteous branch, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, he shall not judge after, uh, notice, after uh, the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. He, he, in other words, he will have a supernatural perception. He, he will judge in truth because he knows all things, uh, even the heart of man. And his judgment is going to be just. His judgment is going to be right. He's not going to be like other judges that they'll have to see something or they'll have to hear something or they'll have to listen to some witnesses or this or that. Or that. No, he, he don't have to do any of that at all. Not, not this judge, not this king, uh, uh, not this ruler. He, he won't need any of that. He, he, don't, he won't need to hear any witnesses. He already knows everything about every individual on the earth. He'll, for the first time ever in the history of the world, there'll be one that will be ruling the earth that knows exactly what to do in every case and every situation. He knows everything because he is the Son of God. He is God come in the flesh. And then verse number four. Isaiah 11, verse 4, but with righteousness shall he judge. Uh, he, he don't have to judge by what he sees or what he hears. He judges by what he knows. And so he judges with righteousness. With righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove the equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips. And he shall uh, slay, uh, slay, slay the wicked. Uh, Jesus is the one that is going to do this. He is the one that can rule the earth in this fashion. Notice how he said that he's going to do it with the rod of his mouth. You see that? The rod of his mouth. Uh, the branches rule this righteous branch, the Lord Jesus Christ. His rule over the nations. Uh, now understand this about him. It will be forceful. He will be a warrior king at his triumphant return to the earth. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 15, it describes his coming where it says, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. You see, his judgment is righteous. 
And he's not influenced by earthly things. Uh, he already knows. He has, he has all knowledge. He has that, that attribute of God. He is omniscient. He knows everything. The poor will get a fair judgment from him uh, like, like they lots of times don't get today. Uh, the poor will get a fair judgment because he's not impressed by the earthly greatness of man. He's not impressed by great wealth. He cannot be bribed. He cannot. He, he does not uh, follow after uh, the corporations of America and do what they want him to do. No, he's not going to be that kind of ruler. Uh, many earthly judges can be bought, and we know that for a fact. Uh, many presidents can be bought. Senators and congressmen, I mean, just go ahead and say it. They can be bought, amen. They're being bought every day. Make the decisions to, uh, for somebody's particular uh, desire. But that's not the way it's going to be with Jesus. When Jesus returns, when Jesus is here, when his kingdom is on the earth, he will judge in righteousness. Whatever he decides about any of us, we can, we can say that we deserve it because he knows all about it, even, even what is in our hearts. You know, the word the, or the rod of his mouth, I, I think we ought to think of it like this, the rod of his mouth, just like, just like described in Revelation, out of his mouth is that sharp sword. That rod of his mouth, that sword, uh, that sharp sword that is in uh, his mouth. I believe that that is really uh, especially a reference to the spoken word of God. The spoken word of God. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is quick, which means it's alive, quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The spoken word of God. It's powerful. I mean, it means something. Uh, in fact, let me give you just this, this simple uh, illustration that we can find in John chapter 18. John chapter 18 and just a verse there, verse number uh, 6. John chapter 18, verse 6. six. Now this is when Jesus has uh, taken his disciples. It's after they had the Last Supper and, and uh, he's instituted the Lord's Supper. He's indicated, you know, how he's going to be betrayed and... and uh, and so they go across the book seed drawing where there's a garden. They enter into the garden. We know it is the garden of Gethsemane. And Judas was there, which betrayed him. He knew the place. And uh, Judas went and he got those 30 pieces of silver. You, you, you know the story. He goes back to the authorities and, and he gets a band of men and officers from the chief priests and, and the Pharisees. They come with lanterns and, and, they, and torches and weapons and they... And they come out to the garden where Jesus is. You remember how Jesus, Judas pointed him out, it tells us in, in, a, in another place, how he pointed him out by, with a kiss. And then, But it tells us in John's Gospel, chapter 18, verse 4, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? Now, this is the Lord Jesus. Now, get the picture in your mind. They're in the garden. You got Judas, he's, he's led uh, this, this uh, band of, of, of soldiers and officers. They've got weapons, they've got lanterns. They, they're going to, they're, they're, their job is to arrest uh, Jesus and, and bring him, bring him in, into Herod. And uh, Jesus, he knew that. He knew it already. And, and yet he stands there and he says to them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Now watch this. Jesus saith unto them. And so it's his spoken word, isn't it? He says it. He saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also which betrayed him stood with them. Now watch this in verse 6. As soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. <laughs> there's, there's power in the, in, the, in the spoken word of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And it's with that two-edged sword and it's with that rod out of his mouth, you see, that he is going to rule, that he is going to reign on the earth. In other words, when he's here, what he says will go. Amen? What he says is the way that it's going to be. Uh, the spoken word of God. But you know, there's the spoken word of God and then there is the written word of God. 
You, you know, you have the wonderful privilege and blessing of, of holding the written word of God in your very hand uh, with your Bible. There's the spoken word of God. There is the written word of God. And I believe we should understand that the spoken word of God and the written word of God must be understood to be the most, uh, to be the two most powerful forces on the earth, For, uh, uh, in the universe. Scientists, uh, many years ago, they uh, learned how to split the atom. And now you have nuclear forces. You have nuclear power. You have nuclear weapons. We have electricity for our homes that comes from a nuclear uh, plant. And it's all from this thing of, of splitting this thing called an atom. And, and, uh, and where did the atom come from? The atom came from God. But they figured how to get the force, how to get the power from that, the fusion of it. And I don't understand all of it, but it's an interesting thing to, uh, to look at and, uh, and to try to understand. But, but people think, well, there we, got, we got power. We can harness the power of the world, harness the power of, of the atom. I'm saying to us tonight, my friend, in the spoken words of God, in the written word of God, there's more power than the most powerful nuclear bomb or weapon in, on this earth. Amen. There's where the power is. It's in the written word of God. It's in the spoken word of God. After all, it is the word of God that was spoken that created everything that you know about. In, in, in the very beginning, in the book of Genesis, God said, let there be light. And there was. And in each step of creation, the Bible tells us that God said, and then it happened. The spoken word of God actually created all things, including that atom that the scientists you know, think so much about with the power that they can, uh, can harness from it. No, it all came from the spoken word of God. God spoke it and, uh, and, it, and it came into existence. The word of God created all things. And then the word of God, uh, the written word of God, Bible that you hold in your hand, the, the words that have been recorded, uh, the written word of God, uh, will, can, is, the, is the word of God that will either condemn us to hell or reward us in, in, with eternal life. Because it's, it's God's word. And the Bible tells us how that we're going to be judged according to the word of God. Uh, this book is what judges us and is what will judge us. In Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Matthew 10, verse 28. Jesus said this, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's, on, that, that, that's the word of God. It's only the word of God that can do that. And when I say that it's the written word of God that will either condemn us to hell or reward us with eternal life, because, dear friend, your eternal destiny depends upon whether you believe this gospel or not. Can you hear an amen to that? Whether you believe this word or not. And so this word is what judges you. For those who say, well, I don't believe it, then according to this book, according to the Bible, your judgment will be hell. You will be condemned to hell. And it's because, simply because you have chosen to not believe. You have chosen to neglect the gospel message that we have of our Savior, the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, his death on the cross his resurrection from the grave, his virgin birth, his, his coming again, uh, his, his kingdom that's coming to the earth. How do we know any of those things? We only know it by this book. Yes. We we'll only know it by the Bible. And it's the Bible that judges. But there is another uh, written record as well. And, uh, and we find that in Revelation chapter 20, verse 15. And uh, at the place of the great white throne judgment, it says, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. You see, there's a written word of God. There's a written book of life. And dear friend, if your name is not recorded there, then, then you, you'll not have eternal life. You'll, you'll never know heaven. 
but instead you'll be cast into the lake of fire. Uh, the written word of God and the spoken word of God. Two most powerful forces in the universe. And, and, and guess what? That's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ, the righteous branch, that's how he is going to be judging this earth. Amen? Amen. That's how he's going to be judging it. And then in verse 5 in Isaiah chapter 11, the last thing here, where it says, And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The word girdle really simply means a belt. It's like a belt that gathers up loose garments together and, and, uh, and, and, and holds them. It, it's, fig, it's, it's, it's a figurative uh, speech or picture for the Messiah's readiness for conflict. He's, going to be, he, he, he's ready. He's ready to come. He's ready to face the, uh, the nations. He's ready to face the armies of, of, of the world. He, he's ready to come. He's bringing his, his army from heaven with him. Uh, and, and so it, it pictures his readiness, righteousness. Now here, here's the thing. What is it that, that is involved in his readiness for what he's going to do to come and rule on this earth? What, what is his readiness all about? His righteousness and his faithfulness are his preparation. That's what's making him ready. That's what makes him ready. His righteousness and his faithfulness. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 14 tells us, put on the whole armor of God, but tells us to stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness. Truth righteousness that's how jesus will rule when he's here on the earth in, in fact according to what it said the way it describes it uh, the way it describes the presence of of the branch the righteous branch the lord jesus christ in his millennial reign on the earth there in verse number five he listen he is absolutely surrounded with righteousness and faithfulness amen that's what he's all about that's who he is. He is. He is righteousness and he is faithfulness. He's faithful to us. My friend, he, he'll be faithful to you if you would turn to him at, to be your savior. If you've never trusted him as savior, if you've never believed upon him, if you would, if you would turn to him and call out to him, he'll be faithful. The Bible says if we'll confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that means for the lost as well, if they'll turn to Christ and believe and confess and call upon his holy name, he will be faithful to save their souls. Amen. He'll be faithful to save you because he was faithful to save us. He'll be faithful to save you. Faithfulness surrounds him. Righteousness surrounds him. And did you know that he offers us, by, by his death on the cross, he offers us his righteousness. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see, he offers you his righteousness. And it's only with that righteousness that you can come before the presence of a holy God. It's only with that righteousness that you can ever enter into heaven, that you can ever have eternal life. It's only with righteousness that you could escape the condemnation of hell and receive the rewards of heaven. Only by having the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Well, see, he took your place on the cross. And it tells us how that that he took that all of my sins and all of your sins was put upon him. He became sin for us. And then in turn, when we believe and trust in him, we are made the righteousness of God in him. And we have to be made the righteousness of God because in ourselves we have no righteousness. We can't build up righteousness. We can't earn righteousness. We can't do righteous things that'll make us fit for heaven. No, we have to be made uh, with his righteousness and that only comes when we surrender ourselves confess our sins 
lay it all upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and God the Father puts it all on God the Son on the cross. That's what happened on the cross. You know, there's a time when Jesus on the cross, the Bible says that, uh, that he cried out to the Father in heaven, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The whole earth became dark. Uh, there's a reason for that. All of my sins and all of your sins and all the sins of mankind were resting upon the Son of God. And in that moment of time, that Heavenly Father that loved the Son, and the Bible tells us that, how, that God how the Father loved the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In that moment of time, because of my sins and yours and the sins of the world were upon Him, God, the Father, had to look away in that moment of judgment. And he had to look away, and then the moment came when also on the cross, Jesus would cry out, it is finished. And then the Bible says he'd give up the ghost. It is he died. It is finished. He died. In that moment, he paid the price for my sins and yours. And when you and I listen, when we recognize that truth, and we believe it and we accept it and we confess it and we trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior. We believe what this book tells us. We trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior. Then, then all of our sin that was placed on him on the cross, he paid the penalty for it by his death and by the shedding of his blood. Then when we trust him in turn, he makes us over with his righteousness. You're born again and have the gift of eternal life. That's what this righteous branch the Lord Jesus has done for us. And it's this branch that Isaiah prophesies of that he speaks about who is coming to rule and reign on this earth, set up his kingdom here. He's gonna run it all with his, with the, with his word, his spoken word, his written word. He's gonna judge all things with his word. And his judgment is in righteousness. His judgment is faithfulness. And his judgment is true. And the thing about it is, we really ought to be glad for the understanding of his coming back to this earth to take over. Amen? I'm, I'm glad. I'm, lo I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to him. I'm glad that he's going to take over. We're praying about the election in America for a president and how we pray that God would give us somebody to take over that would be a good man. Uh, we pray for that. But I tell you what, it's never really going to be right until Jesus takes over. Amen. And he's going to. Not just in America, but the whole world. And it may be sooner than it will be later. The question is, dear friend, are you ready? If not, you need to get ready and trust Christ today as to be Savior and Lord of your life. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand together, church, our heads bowed, our eyes closed for prayer. Lord, we do thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for this uh, prophet Isaiah, for this uh, wonderful picture that we're seeing of, of your coming kingdom to the earth. And, and, and Lord Jesus, our, our Savior, will be reigning upon this earth and ruling in righteousness. And we know that it's, it's only the Lord Jesus that could even do that. And so, Lord, we, we trust, we believe, we know that you're coming. We pray, Lord, for that one that maybe will pick this message up online that, that has never been saved, never been born again, that you'd speak to that heart, you'd speak to that, that individual, draw them to faith in Christ before it's too late. And then, Lord, help us to just rest in your faithfulness, to, uh, Lord, to... Uh, to, to just worship you and thank you for your grace. Lord, we do look forward to your coming. We pray that you'd help us to serve you. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us to, to see others come into your kingdom and to be made ready. And Lord, we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. and amen. Let's sing our song together as Brother Tim leads us tonight. Page 270.